Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design uh, Topic 7 um, in some calculation of sample sizes. In the last video, I talked about the ideas behind calculation of sample sizes, the relationship between calculation of sample size and power. And on this video, I will talk about some specific cases of uh, sample size calculation, okay? So here, let's consider a general case, especially for computer science, where we have two means and from two different samples and we want to compare them. So as I said before, uh, the sample size calculation is something that you do at the experiment design stage before you do the experiment. So you use parameters from the, um, you, you define the parameters for your experimental design in order to calculate the sample size. So in this case, let's assume that we want a significance alpha of 0 0.05, okay, so a traditional value, 95% significance, and we desire a power, one of minus beta, of 0 0.8, okay? So our power here is, um, we want a 0 0.8 power. Now, for this experiment, our minimally relevant effect size, okay, so the effect size that we are interested in detecting is 15, okay? But we don't know the variance of the, of the two samples, okay? So how can we obtain the, the required sample size in this case, okay? If we don't know the variance, but we know that they are approximately equal, the calculation of the sample size is given by this formula. N, which will be the sample size for both samples, so the number of experiments in sample one and the number of experiments in sample two, will be two, uh, will be approximately equal to two times the, uh, uh, the, quanti the alpha divided by two quantile of a t-distribution with two n minus n degree of freedoms, and the beta quantile plus the beta quantile of a t-distribution with 2n minus 2 degrees of freedom um, divided by the d, d star, where d star is the minimal significant effect divided by sigma, which is the variance. So this is, we talked about this before, is the standardized minimally interesting effect size, the minimally, minimally interesting effect divided by the uh, variance of our system, okay? So how can we do, can we do this calculation? So we have a formula. Uh, take a quick, take a look at this formula and see if there's anything that's missing here. Well, one thing that's missing here is that we need the variance to calculate the sample size. But if we don't do the experiment, how do we know the variance? How can we know the variance before doing the experiment? Okay, there are a few ways to proceed. There are a few ways to deal with this problem. Uh, in general, we can say that if we have process knowledge, so like I mentioned before, we have an engineer that knows the process, so we have like a human scientist that knows the situation that we are investigating, or we have a manual or something like that, a simulator, a model, we can use this domain knowledge, uh, this domain knowledge to have an initial estimate of the variance. Of course, this initial estimate of the variance will become one of the assumptions of our, uh, of our test. So here we are creating a new assumption to our, to our statistic, and this assumption will have to be validated. So if we say, okay, using this estimate for the variance, we decided that we need uh, 30, uh, we need 15 uh, observations in your sample. Then you do your experiment. After you analyze your experiment, you validate is my variance really this? Is, is, is my variance really this value? If the variance is bigger than what we estimated, then the power of our experiment will be lower. We have to recalculate the power of experiment to see if it's still acceptable. If the variance is smaller, well, great. Then the power of our experiment is higher, so nothing was lost. Okay. Um, we can also use uh, a standardized minimal value to calculate sample size. So instead of using uh, a minimal 
value of interest, we can use something like, okay, I am interested in a difference of at least 5%. This 5% does not depend on the variance. So we can use this value uh, as a proxy. It's not as precise, but uh, we don't know if 5%, depend, depending on the application, this might not be feasible, but it's something that you can use if you don't know the variance. Finally, uh, we can form a pilot study. A pilot study is when you do a small number of experiments to estimate some of the parameters necessary. In this case, I'm doing, uh, I'm collecting a small number of observations in order to estimate the variance for the design of the main experiment. Okay, each of these approaches has their advantages and the drawbacks, and you have to decide which approach you are going to use to obtain um, values for your power calculation. Let's think about the pilot study, okay? If we don't have no information at all to estimate the variance of the process, uh, we have to perform a pilot study. Uh, the sample, the, and how do we calculate the sample size for the pilot study, okay? There are some formulas. For example, one example of a formula is that the n of the pilot study can be two times the percentile of the significance uh, in uh, the person, the significance person, significance quantile of the z distribution divided by e, where e is the maximum relative error, like the our maximum possible estimate of a relative error. Now, these kind of calculations generally usually generates some very very large sample sizes, so it's not a very recommended approach. Uh, you need to, I mean, if you have no other information, well, that's got to be what you got to do, but uh, it needs to be used carefully. Okay. <clears throat> but let's assume that we have the standard deviation. We obtain it somehow from a pilot study or maybe from some manual or maybe use a relative case. Well, in that case, um, let's say that for our, the experiment that we said before, we, uh, we discovered that the standard deviation sigma is approximately equal to 50. So we can go back to that uh, equation and uh, we assume that we have equal sample sizes and we have here delta, that we have our minimal delta, that are our, mi our, our minimal effect, CD5 effect. We have our variance and now we just need to calculate this, right? We have just, to have, we, we have a formula for the, for the quantile for the t-distribution. Any other problems? Well, there is still one more problem that we have to solve. To calculate the quantile, we need to know the degrees of freedom. And to calculate the degrees of freedom, we need to know the number of samples. So now we have the chicken and egg problem here, right? To know the number of samples, we need the number of samples. This is called a transcendental equation. So this equation is transcendental. You need, we need a value to calculate that value. How do we do that? Well, the standard approach is to do iteration. We estimate an initial value for n, or in this case, we need to calculate this t. So we estimate an initial value for tk to be approximately equal to zk. So we use the normal distribution as a proxy here. And then we calculate this formula using z and we're going to have a val initial value of n using this new initial value of n we calculate this formula again using t and n and we're going to see the difference this we're going to give us a different value of n so we repeat the, the we repeat the formula over and over again until it converges to a fixed value of n okay so we need to find the smallest n that satisfies n is bigger than the estimated uh, estimated uh, deviation divided by the minimal value of interest, t alpha alpha divided by two plus t b. Okay. All right. Uh, of course, uh, we can program this depending on the case, uh, but in practice, we are going to use uh, a, a sample size calculator. For instance, here in R for the comparison of two, um, two samples with no significant, with no standard deviation, uh, we can use the power t-test again. 
So here we have the power two test. We have the delta. Our, our delta was 15, and our standard deviation was also 15. We have our significance level equal to 0 0.05, and our, our power equal to 0 0.8, okay? So when we calculate here, and here we see we're doing a two-sample test. We're gonna have the same output as before, and we see that for a significance level of 0 0.05 and a power of 0 0.8, uh, the power test is recommending a sample size of 13. Well, 13.09, so 14, right? We have to round this up. Very important to note that this N is for each group. So it's not the total number of samples, of observations, it's the number of observations in each sample. So the first sample needs 14 observations, the second sample also needs 14 observations. What if the variances are not equal, okay? So if we have unequal variances, we are going to use the Welch t-test. And in this case, um, <clears throat> we are going to, um, the, the, the calculation of sample size for the unequal case is not very difficult. Um, if we're going, we could do a, a balanced test, we could use both, but we can do an unbalanced test where the sample with a smaller variance has less observations than a sample with more variances, okay? In this case, it's not hard to show that the optimal allocation of observation is to keep the proportion. So the proportion of samples between, the, the proportion of observations between the first sample and the second sample should be equal to the proportions of variance between the first sample and the second sample. So if we have a good estimation of the variances for both, well, for both samples, we can use uh, a proportional number of um, observations for each sample. In the case of pair tests, okay, pair, pair tests, as we saw in the, in, the, in the lecture number four, pair tests usually are more sensitive than unpaired tests because they include the assumption that the observations of two samples, they are correlated, okay? So if you don't remember the lecture, pair test is when you have for both treatments, say for algorithm one and algorithm two, you have the same sets of uh, input data, let's say graphs, and you test algorithm one in graph one, algorithm two in graph one, algorithm one in graph two, algorithm two in graph two. So in this case, each observation is, they have a relationship and you can use this relationship in your test to make the test more powerful, okay? So pair tests usually require small, smaller sample sizes for the same power and the same uh, significance, okay? In this case, this is especially true when the variation, so for instance, if each case has a very diff has uh, if there's a lot of variation differences between each case, but the repetitions in one case itself they don't have a lot of variation. Okay, so if we have a in level variation, in other words, the variation of uh, each case is sigma e, and it's much smaller than the variation of all cases, which is sigma u, then if we have a large enough n, we can see that the n for the unpaired test divided by the n for the paired test would be two of the uh, proportion of these two variances plus one. So we can calculate the n for an unpaired test, and from that, we calculate what would be the n for the paired test, okay? Okay, all of these are comparisons between two means to show difference. But we also saw in lecture, we also saw in lecture five, a special case of a test to uh, test equivalence. So how do we calculate the sample size for equivalence? If you remember, the test for equivalence is two tests. One test to show that a sample is smaller than a certain value, and one test to show that a sample is bigger than a sample value. So we have the sample is smaller than this, but the sample is bigger than this. Therefore, the sample is equivalent to this middle value, okay? So in the case of a, a single sample, 
we have, uh, we calculate the N, we still calculate using the interactive process, but in this case, the interactive process is this inequality. N is the smallest N that is bigger than the T, the alpha, uh, uh, the alpha quantile of T with N minus two degrees, of, two, N, two N minus one degrees of freedom, plus the beta quantile of T with N minus one degrees of freedom, with uh, estimator of significance alpha. And here we subtract from the minimal value of uh, interest, this delta U, which is the difference, uh, which is the limits of the means that we are testing, okay? So as, before, as I explained in the beginning, we use an interactive, an interactive process where the initial estimate for Tx is Zx, which is the, uh, the normal distribution. And then we repeat the iteration until the, we find the smallest n that obeys this equation. If we have, if we're trying to show equivalence between the two means, it's a very similar calculation as to show the difference between two means. If the sample, if the samples, if both of them have approximately the same, uh, the same deviation, and if we're trying to show equivalence, usually they have the same, the, the same, uh, the same deviation. So we can use similar sample sizes, n1 equal to n2, that's equal to n, and we're going to use here um, n is will be the this will be the inequality and will be bigger than t alpha v t beta v with the two, the sum of the two deviations and the minimal effect minus delta mu and delta mu which is smaller than the minimal effect is the maximum real difference between the two means for which uh, the power is desired okay So these are all the cases for, uh, these are all cases for two samples that we studied in this course. Finally, we'll quickly think about the sample sizes formula for ANOVA, okay? So if you remember, uh, this is from the last lecture, ANOVA is the test that you use when you have multiple samples, like four, five, six samples, and you want to identify whether some of these samples are have a difference uh, have a have a different distribution than the overall distribution that include all of the samples. So this is done by calculating a proportion of the variances. Okay. Now, if you remember from the last lecture, the ANOVA has two stages: the initial stage where we compare all the samples to see if any of them will be different from the overall population. And the post hoc step where we saw that there is a difference, but we don't know where the difference is. So we compare each of the samples in order to, uh, to determ determine uh, where the difference is. Um, first, let's talk about the, the sample size of the initial ANOVA test, okay? So the formulas are almost as simple as those used for the t-test, okay? First, we, we need to know we want, we, the formulas are based on this equality. The F distribution, the F quantile for one minus alpha will be equal to the F quantile for B, um, uh, where the, for, uh, the parameter, the, this parameter is given by this value, the sum N of one to A. And if you remember, this is the error factor uh, this is the error value for uh, uh, factor A in the statistical model, divided by the grand, uh, the grand deviance, okay? So this is the non-centrality parameter. This is the parameter that indicates how much some of the factors A uh, will deviate from the central location. Of course, uh, as you can see here, we need n to calculate this, and we're trying to calculate n. So this will be an interactive process. Okay, let's give. Let's go back to using the numbers that we used in the paper new example from the last lecture. So in the paper new examples, we had four levels, four types of paper. 
with alpha 0 0.05. So we were, were interested in a 95% confidence. And the overall error is seven, okay? <clears throat> and we want to be able to detect whether two, any two means have a difference of magnitude. Any of the two mean, any of the two factors have a difference of magnitude at least 12 with power one minus beta 0 0.8, power 0 0.8. Under these conditions, uh, there are different several cases that we discussed for the post hoc test, right? Maybe uh, some of the, we want to know if any of them is different from the grand mean, or we want to know if one level is different from all of the other levels. In the case where we want to have some levels different from the grand mean, we can use these, the T values as uh, one level is sigma, is smaller than the grand mean, one level is bigger, is smaller than the grand mean, and two levels are equal to the grand mean. And the second assumption is like, okay, we have one level that is uh, alpha minus one, uh, level one is smaller, and other than the levels, they are bigger. So one level is smaller than the grand mean by, uh, by delta, and all the other levels are bigger than the grand mean by delta. Notice that these are not the only two uh, possible uh, options, like how you define these vectors. So these are the vectors of the differences that we are trying to detect, okay? So this is one estimate for this vector. This is another estimate for this vector. Uh, the estimates for this tau vector depend on your experiment design. What are you expecting what, what to happen? Uh, the order doesn't really happen, matter. It just meant, that, okay, we want one of the factors to be smaller, one of the factors to be bigger, and there are two other factors I will expect that they behave kind of similar. So this is the minimum difference that you can detect. Uh, this sigma here, it's not only for one value, like when we're comparing only two, 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 only two samples, this sigma must be uh, equivalent, must, be, must refer to all of the samples that we are dealing with. Okay, so let's try to do the calculation by hand. So our no centrality parameter becomes four uh, times six, six. So this is extracting these numbers and putting into the formula. So we have that the no centrality parameter becomes 5.88, and we can now do the iteration on this formula. So by doing it by hand, we can see that the tau will be uh, minus delta delta zero zero, okay? And we can do this for, while the quantile of f for one minus alpha, alpha a minus one, a times n minus one is bigger than the quantile of f of beta a minus one, a times n minus one times the uh, tau parameter, okay? And we are going to keep increasing n, increasing the value. We start with our initial value of n and we're going to increase the value of n until we find the smallest n that can satisfy this equation. And we see with this interactive process, with this loop, the smallest n is nine. So nine will be the number of samples that we need for each of the wood types, okay? Of course, we can do this uh, using the function, uh, the power function, and the power function will find the exactly same value. So power ANOVA test, just like we have power kit test, we have power ANOVA test, and the power ANOVA test for four groups, um, variance tau, um, and we have also the within variance sigma two and the sigma level alpha and the power one minus beta, and the T value will be 8.4. Uh, <clears throat> the second case, so that was for the first case, the second case is the same, okay? So we define tau as delta for this and we calculate the variance of tau of the non centrality and we can calculate the same thing. And if we are calculating one against all the others, we just need uh, six uh, observations for each sample. Now, it's important to notice that this procedure is to calculate the uh, sample size for the ANOVA test. But if you remember from last class, after the ANOVA test, we are going to do a, a series of t-tests like one versus all or all versus all, 
In these three tests, we have a modification to the uh, alpha value given by the multiple comparison adjustment. In this case, in the case where uh, we have this post hoc, it turns out that the number of observations in the post hoc tests is usually much higher than the number of observations in for the ANOVA test. So it's more common if you design the experiment using the um, the, the sample the sample calculation for the post hoc test then using the sample calculation for the ANOVA test. So you think about all the paired comparisons that you need to do in the post hoc test, and you see the number of observations that you need for those, and you use those number of observations as the number of observation in your experiment. Okay? Well, to, come to summarize these formulas and concepts, so I explained several formulas and concepts for calculating uh, sample size in several of the tests that I described in this course, but this is only scratching the surface. Depending on what kind of test you are doing and um, what is the type of data that you have, they are different. For instance, we did not mention sample size calculations for uh, non-parametric tests, etc. So, but the key idea is that you understand the characteristics of the population, like what is the minimum value that you are interested in? What is the power that you are interested in? So you have to understand what is the influence of power on the analysis of your test? What is the, um, and by understanding all of this, uh, uh, this information about your experiment, uh, you can inform yourself about what is the uh, sample, sample size calculation that you need, okay? For more information, especially focused on computer science, there is this paper from 2019 uh, that describes a very detailed way to calculate uh, sample size for the specific test of comparing the performance of two algorithms. So you have two algorithms and you have a measure of performance and you want to compare the two algorithms. Uh, Felipe describes in this paper a very specific way to calculate the sample size. So I recommend uh, for everyone that is watching this video to read this paper as a complement to this lecture. Okay, so also there are, so this is the first link for the recommended read. There are two more links, the two more papers that talk a little bit more about sample size calculations in different situations. And that is it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed and I see you Friday for the question session. Thank you.